By far the trickiest part of setting up an enclosure for a reptile or amphibian is choosing and installing the correct heating and lighting. In today's video I'm going to be giving an overview of this process by walking through the lighting rig that I selected for my new line day gecko enclosure, although the information that I share today will be applicable to any species. Traditionally, people have viewed light in a reptile enclosure as a means to provide it with constant temperatures, and this trend has seen a surge in different products which are all designed specifically for the job. However, in the rush to maintain temperatures at selected values, herpetoculturists have lost sight of the fact that the heaters we very often use nowadays do a particularly poor job at replicating the form and composition of sunlight. As more and more research is being done, we're starting to understand that reptiles and amphibians are only able to function properly via close interactions with sunlight, and so there is a new shift in the hobby towards trying to replicate it. And rightly so. To make things easier, we split sunlight into the fractions ultraviolet B, ultraviolet A, visible light, infrared A and infrared B, and then look at each of these fractions in turn, our aim being, in each case, to offer them to our reptiles and amphibians in the same form and intensity as the particular species of reptile or amphibian would find that particular fraction out in the wild. Of all of these fractions of sunlight, UVB is by far the most regularly talked about and familiar because many species of herb will end up suffering of a condition called metabolic bone disease if they aren't offered UVB in the appropriate intensities. Many species of crepuscular and nocturnal animal can be maintained in captivity without ultraviolet B exposure, so long as their vitamin D requirements are met through oral supplementation, although, as I've discussed in many videos in the past, this can't be allowing them to synthesise it naturally through exposure to UVB. Presumably because companies clocked on to the fact that you can make a tidy living from selling products which can stop people's pets looking like this, there are lots of lamps on the market these days packaged up for reptiles which do offer ultraviolet B. The main types of UVB emitting bulbs are compact fluorescence, T8 linear fluorescence, T5 linear fluorescence, mercury vapour bulbs and metal halides. Compact fluorescents offer UVB over such a small area that they are only ever going to be useful for the smallest of reptiles. Anything bigger than a leopard gecko really isn't going to get much benefit from a compact UVB bulb. This, as well as other complications to the use and selection, is why I won't really be talking about them in this video. Linear fluorescents are fundamentally similar to compact UVB bulbs, only they irradiate a much larger area. Linear fluorescents can be bought which offer either approximately 2, 5, 10 or 14% of their output as UVB. The higher this value is, the more intense the UVB will be at a set distance away from the lamp. In each case, the T8 variety will be less intense than the T5 variety. Both T8 and T5 lamps need to be fitted with a specific ballast or a fitting which has a ballast included, like the fitting that I'll be setting up later in the video. Mercury vapour bulbs have various pros and cons, but in any case, it seems to be that what these lamps do can be done better by other lamps, and so these are another type of lamp I'll be ignoring for the rest of the video. Metal halides are on the market which offer part of their output as UVB. However, this does tend to degrade within an unsuitably short amount of time, much less than the 12 months expected of a typical fluorescent lamp, and so metal halides can't really be viewed as suitable for long-term UVB provision. Where metal halides really come into their own is in providing visible light, which is something we'll get onto in a minute. In order to select the right UVB lamps for your reptiles and amphibians, you need to first find out what UVB intensity they require. We quantify UVB intensity in terms of the UV index, or in UVI units. I'll leave a link in the description to a document which tells you the appropriate UVI for a range of different species so that you can find out what you're aiming for. Because the intensity of radiation provided by a lamp decreases as you move away from it, selecting the right one in terms of UV provision is a process of finding out how far away the lamp will end up being from your reptile when it is basking and selecting the one which will, at that distance, produce the desired UVI. 
In order to make sure that you are offering the correct UVI for your animal, and also to check whether old lamps have burnt out or not and need replacing, it is worthwhile getting a solar meter 6.5, which can give you an immediate readout of UVI when you press the button. So with all of that explaining out of the way, let me tell you about the UV lamps that I got for my enclosure. Firstly, I got a 3 foot long, 12% output, T5 UVB fixture from Arcadia. I like these fixtures because they're easy to install, take up little space and require no additional ballasts. It's important for me to point out here that you don't want to have basking zone UV intensities over the entire enclosure, so in most cases a UV lamp the entire length of the vivarium is unsuitable. Reptiles really need shade as much as they do a place to bask. However, Seeing as the animals that are going in this enclosure are adept climbers, and it is 3 feet tall, they are going to be more than able to move away from the UV if they want to. To further facilitate self-regulation, you'll see that I've got a branch which runs from the basking zone in the upper right portion of the enclosure down to the lower left, and this is going to allow the geckos to move left and down away from the lamp at the same time, and so access the desired light gradient. UVB, like the rest of the radiation discussed in this video, is going to be partially blocked by mesh, the degree to which it is blocked depending on the density of the mesh, with more dense meshes blocking more of the radiation. To counteract this effect, I bought a UVB lamp which had a higher percentage of its output as UVB than I would have required if no mesh had been present. As it turned out, when I got the lamp and put it in place, I learned that the mesh on this vivarium from Custom Aquaria blocked a lot less of the radiation than I was expecting, and so the UV indices were much too high for the geckos. I'm only aiming for a UVI of 5 to 6 at the basking zone, so this is going to be way too much. To combat this, all I did was cut out some spare mesh that I had lying around and sat the UV lamp on top of it, getting more layers of mesh until I got the UVI that I wanted. For me, this just illustrates why it's so important to get a solar meter 6.5. The second UVB providing lamp that I'm using is a metal halide by Reptile Technologies, powered with a Lucky Reptile Bright Sun Ballast, already wired up for me because I bought it second hand. The main reason for me wanting this lamp is that it's going to help me to provide visible light intensities like that in natural sunlight, but in terms of UVB, it is going to help offer a nice boost of the stuff at the basking site. This time, I set the metal halide up away from the enclosure and measured the UV index at different distances away from it, and determined what the right distance would be to hang the lamp above the enclosure on a lamp stand which I custom built. And with that, UVB provision is complete. Unfortunately, UVA remains quite a bit of a mystery to us at the moment. We've got no way of measuring its intensities properly, and we know very little about its interactions with herbs, aside from the fact that they might be able to see it to some degree. Compact fluorescent lamps, linear lamps, mercury vapour bulbs, and metal halides can all offer UVA, but because we aren't able to measure the intensity of it, we have no real way of knowing whether they do so in a fashion which replicates sunlight in the way that we are trying to achieve. There's at least one line of reasoning which suggests that metal halides emit UVA in the correct ratio to other wavelengths for their output to appear white to reptiles, whereas the outputs of other lamps almost certainly appear tinted. We aren't exactly certain about this though. So having said all of that, I can't really recommend anything in particular about UVA provision, except that keep your minds open to it for when we find out more about it in years to come. It might come as a shock for me to tell you that we also don't know particularly much about visible light, except for the fact that reptiles and amphibians can definitely see it, and that because it constitutes so much of sunlight, it probably contributes largely to the warming effect that sunlight has. All of the lamps mentioned in this video, being compact fluorescents, T8 and T5 linear fluorescents, mercury vapour bulbs, metal halides, LEDs, tungsten halogen lamps and carbon filament lamps do offer some amount of visible light, but out of those, only metal halides and particular LEDs are able to offer it in intensities which come close to matching sunlight. 
we are able to quantify visible light intensity in terms of lux, but because this is a measurement weighted for human vision, it's only useful up to a point when applied to reptile and amphibian husbandry. A more suitable measurement is something that we're working on. For any reptile or amphibian, a strip LED should be employed to offer a background level of lux, which is similar to that found outside at dawn and dusk or in the shade. For heliocentric or sun-seeking species, which in nature would bask during broad daylight, you will want to boost visible light intensities at the basking zone, and this can be achieved using either a metal halide or a spot LED. Although we haven't got a suitable measurement of visible light intensity yet, it would seem to be the case from some early experiments that 35 to 45 watt metal halides or spot LEDs should produce the right visible light intensity at a basking spot about 20 to 30 centimetres away from the lamp. For my line day gecko enclosure, I bought a three foot long jungle dawn LED bar to provide the background visible light intensity. I chose one of these because they offer a lot more background visible light than any of the alternatives they're going to. In the basking area, I'm using both the 35 watt metal halide and the 40 watt Dasku spot LED. I'm using both types of lamp because I want to see if there's any preference shown by the geckos, and also because using two allows me to extend the basking zone so that the geckos aren't competing over one little spot. It's worth me pointing out that I definitely would not angle both of these lamps so that they illuminate the same spot, because then that spot would have so much visible light that it would be that intense that the animals wouldn't want to bask there. Remember that what we're doing here is trying to find the right dose of each form of radiation for our herbs. The last fractions of the solar spectrum which we've yet to consider are infrared A and infrared B, which we can lump together as near infrared. We know that infrared A in particular can have healing effects and that it can warm up an animal rather quickly by penetrating right through the skin and warming up its core, but yet we still have quite a lot to learn about near infrared as a whole. Two lamps, being tungsten halogen lamps and carbon filament lamps, are able to offer both of infrared A and infrared B, but the ratio of these wavelengths found in sunlight is much more closely approximated by the output of a tungsten halogen lamp, and so these should always be used with reptiles. We have no proper way of determining near-infrared intensities at the moment, although we are working on a solution that will hopefully be finished in not too many months. For the time being, the most promising lead is that if you put your hand underneath the lamp, then what you are aiming for is for it to feel warm, but only gently warm. You don't want to put your hand under and then it starts feeling uncomfortable after a minute because then the near-infrared is almost certainly too intense. But of course, if it doesn't feel warm at all, then it's too weak. Believe it or not, this relatively primitive method of determining the suitability of a lamp actually seems to match up quite well with the calculations we've been doing so far, which is why I'm confident in recommending it. For me day gecko enclosure, what I've currently got installed is just a 50 watt halogen lamp, although from the observations and calculations I've done, I think this probably isn't quite powerful enough, and so I'll probably change it in the near future. Notice that I've not got the lamp attached to any sort of dimmer, because if the lamp is dimmed, then its output resembles sunlight less closely, and of course this defeats the object of trying to replicate sunlight. Now on that note, you will probably have noticed that at no point during this video have I yet mentioned thermostats, thermometers, or even temperatures. As I said at the very beginning, temperature control is a completely separate matter to replicate in sunlight, and so temperature control is something which I will come back to in a future video. What I am saying is that none of the lamps shown in this video should be used for trying to maintain set point temperatures. Don't get confused about that. Another thing I've alluded to several times but haven't stated explicitly is that you don't want basking conditions throughout the entire enclosure. Reptiles and amphibians have evolved to function by moving to and from areas of light and shade, and so if we want our herbs to thrive in captivity then we need to provide them with this by offering designated basking zones and then cooler, darker areas elsewhere. This is something we call the light and shade method. So, having watched through all of that, I hope that you've now got a pretty decent idea of how to light a herb enclosure. The couple of things which I still want to say are to do with 
timing lights to turn on and off, and also temperature control. But these are quite in-depth topics which I will dedicate other videos to, and there are also videos I've done in the past um, about these topics, and so those should be showing up right now in the end screen cards. So anyway, I hope that you have enjoyed this video, and if you have, then you will consider subscribing to the channel, because for now, I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example, and I'll see all of you in the next video. Bye guys!